Well, hello everyone. I'm James Minor. I'm a partner in the Capital Markets Group in Vancouver, and I'm from McMillan LLP. So who is McMillan? Well, we're a large law firm. We have offices across Canada. We also have offices in Hong Kong. But the neat thing about our office is we have the capabilities to do small files and big files. But our, our, our secret ingredient is we actually have U.S. lawyers in Vancouver who are staffed on all our deals. So if you're going public and you know, you, you're thinking about entering the U.S. marketplace as well, you don't need to retain extra counsel. We have the capabilities of, of doing everything across Canada and into the States. And that's actually a really good segue. Everything that I say in my presentation today isn't legal advice, but if you do need legal advice, I'm happy to connect you with a good lawyer. So talking about our experience, we have significant issuer experience across all categories. Right now, we're seeing uh, a lot of issuers enter into the tech space. Uh, historically, we've done a lot of resource uh, work as well. Vancouver is always going to be tied to resource issuers. So to the extent that uh, you have resource files, we're always happy to help. Um, given the state of the market, it's shifted around and, and it's a cycle. So right now, we're seeing the same kinds of people that have historically done resource files that are now moving into technology files uh, and, uh, and the marijuana space is actually extremely active as well. So I'm going to take you through two different pieces. Uh, the first piece is how we go public and I'm going to give you the general overview of the two types of transactions an issuer would do to actually be listed on CSE or another stock exchange. And then the third slide we're going to go through is probably the most important one. It's the most common missteps, the stuff that we really see there tied to junior issuers that do these missteps time and time again. And with our experience, you can you know, cure these missteps and be quicker to get to the market. Ah. That's a misstep, so we'll just go with that. Typical ways a company can go public. So we really have two, two ways that a company can go public. The first is a reverse takeover, and I'll explain that in a minute. And the second is an additional public offering. And there's pros and cons, obviously, to both. Start with the first one, initial public offering. This is you know, your, your gold-plated style of, of uh, getting listed on, on an exchange. Now, typically, these, uh, this process takes a little bit longer. It can take up to a year to actually do your initial uh, public offering. But we can also do it quite quickly, especially on an exchange like the CSE, and we can get those issuers listed in, in about three to four months. The beautiful thing, or a pro with initial public offering, is it's your company. You've taken an idea, you've gone public, your capital structure is your own, and you don't have any legacy issues. So when you're going public, um, you're going through your audit process, which our friends at Davidson will talk about. You're going through your, uh, your transfer agent process, which our friends at ComputerShare will talk about. And you're basically taking your project from zero to listed on the exchange. Now there's another way of going public, which is called the reverse takeover. Now the reverse takeover is you're essentially stepping into the shoes of another issuer. And a reverse takeover is typically triggered on the CSE when you have 100% dilution or if you're going to be swapping out the majority of your board of directors and the majority of your management. So to put it simply, the issuer that once was isn't anymore because the mind and management has effectively changed. Now there's a massive pro with the RTO transaction. It's a lot quicker. You don't need to go through uh, the prospectus process and become a reporting issuer in Canada. And why? Because you're already a reporting issuer because the, the target that you're taking over has already been listed on a stock exchange. You can get it done quite quickly. Really the only requirement that is attached to it is that the, the new issuer meets the listing requirements of the CSE. And you also have a shareholders meeting. So the shareholders would be able to approve this new board or this new idea that's coming in. Now the one flaw or the one downside of the reverse takeover transaction is it's not really your company. So you've taken over a company, you've stepped into the shoes of it, but there could be some legacy issues with it. There could be some uh, securities that have been issued that have large overhangs, or there could be some liability associated with the company. To put it into a nutshell, it's essentially a company you're taking over, and you're taking over all the good and all the bad with it. And when we're going public on the CSE, both these are, are great options to take your company public. 
Um, I like the RTO as long as it's a clean shell because it's nice and clean. We're not dealing with any other securities regulators. We're basically just dealing with the CSE. But there's certainly uh, a lot of IPOs that we do as well. And um, really, if you're going to be structuring, if you want a clean transaction, that's, uh, that's, an, that's, a, that's a great way to, uh, to structure it. So let's talk a little bit about the common missteps in the go public process. And I can, I can think of four of them that really trip up the junior issuers. Now, when I'm talking about the missteps, we are talking about the junior issuers, and we're not going to be talking about uh, issues uh, affecting the senior issuers. So the first one is failure to comply with securities law. So if you're seeking to go public and you've issued securities in the past, you're essentially what's called a private issuer. And you can issue securities, generally speaking, to 50 shareholders. But as soon as you cross over that 50 shareholder threshold, you're in this gray area. You're not a public issuer, but you're not a private issuer anymore. And the problem uh, that's, that some of the junior issuers see is they think they can just issue securities to whoever they want and whenever they want. And when you go to uh, structure your transaction, either in an RTO or uh, prospectus offering, if you haven't made the applicable filings, it's going to be a very big problem and a very big hurdle for you to cross. So the word of warning there is when you're issuing your securities, have a legal team involved to make sure that the securities are <laughs> actually being issued in accordance with prospectus exemptions. And when you cross that 50 security holder threshold, make sure that you make your exempt market filings with respect to those. The second big misstep that we see is failure to structure uh, the actual uh, security transaction. And what I mean by that is, is how you structure the security holders of the, of, of, the, of the issuer. Now, I get it. People want to issue cheap shares. And cheap shares are fine, and they, uh, they incentivize certain people to act for the company. But too many cheap shares is a bad thing. It's a bad thing for a bunch of reasons. But the most important one is it's going to prohibit you from getting listed on a stock exchange. So when we're talking about cheap shares on the CSE, we're talking about shares that are issued at two cents or below. And if you're issuing shares at that price, then there's going to be a whole bunch of restrictions on it. Very generally speaking, if you have cheap shares that are more than 25% of your market float, you're not going to meet listing requirements. And if you issue shares in the last 18 months of less than 0 0.005 of a dollar, then you're not going to qualify for CSE listing requirements. The point there is all issuers have cheap shares, but you need to structure them appropriately to actually meet your, your listing requirements. The third big misstep that we see is these issuers that want to go public quite quickly. And they think they can do it quite quickly because they have a business plan already done. And when we take a look at the business plan, it's two pages, and it's not really well thought out. So to cure that, the business plan needs to be thought about first. And you need to get the accounting firms and the, and the lawyers involved with those to make sure that you actually have a business plan that can stand the scrutiny of, of the listing standards. And, um, and we can definitely assist with there as well. Now the fourth point that, uh, that the junior issuers fail to do is lining up their, their, their financial statements. Now Davison will, will talk about this as well, but when you go public, you need to have financial statements. And when you have financial statements, they need to be audited. There shouldn't be any surprises here. But that's the funny thing, because it often is a surprise with the junior issuers. So if you take any point from this presentation, make sure that your audited financial statements are lined up well in advance before you try to go public. So how can we help? Well, as I said before, we have lawyers who do all different kinds of industries. So we have the experience to help you. But we also have the experience to stitch together these four common missteps. We can help you comply with securities law to make sure that when you actually issue your securities, you, you comply with the applicable law. We can structure the securities in your transaction to make sure you're not offside the cheap shares. We can help you develop the business plan so we can have that ready to roll out in your prospectus or your uh, filing statement when we're ready to go. And finally, we understand financial statements. We can actually assemble this and make sure that you have a ready-made book so when you're going public, the audited statements are, are ready. So those are essentially the, the four points that uh, junior issuers, in our experience, fail to, to hit. And uh, we're happy to assist with, uh, with any issuer.
So I'll be available on the panel to answer questions uh, after this presentation, but I'm happy to take any questions now. <laughs>